Yeah, and thank you. Thank you for being here. And I think it's it's uh, just absolutely. Um, I just want to pass along my congratulations again on the the arbitration case and the uh, and the positive outcome for for NAFTA gas. That's something that we, of course, at the United States, have been following for some time, uh, and I think it's a a great step forward for kind of importing or exporting, um, you know, rule of law and and the uh, the market liberalization sort of uh, dynamics that are that are really needed for for supporting European energy security. So I really appreciate uh, in that context. Um, what, what former Prime Minister Bilt was, was uh, kind of so eloquently giving us a, a historical overview. Yeah. And I think that there is a U.S. nexus there as well. We have been, um, just for, for, for a matter of, of context, supporting European energy security for many, many decades. Um, my, my understanding of what we've specifically been doing uh, in supporting our European partners, standing shoulder to shoulder uh, with our, our closest European allies, uh, has gone back to the fall of the wall back in, in 19, uh, you know, 1989 or, or so. Uh, and that ranges from supporting the, um, you know, the Baku Tbilisi Jehan oil pipeline as a diversification uh, uh, measure in the, uh, in the 1990s, all the way through to everything that we're doing today. And, and we really have kind of five strategic areas that we engage on. Um, which n are, are in no way the U.S. exporting, you know, our will on the European Union in terms of um, in terms of supporting its energy security. But these are all Europe's own goals, and that includes supporting diversification of energy infrastructure through support of the Europe's own um, projects of common interest list, supporting uh, market liberalization and energy policy. That is the third energy package, and the uh, the main tenets of the European Energy Union. Uh, and then kind of in the, the broader energy security standpoint, cyber and physical security of energy infrastructure, because you can have the most liberalized market, you can have the most diverse um, uh, and, and well-functioning uh, uh, infrastructure pattern, but a cyber and physical uh, threat to your infrastructure will, will end your day pretty quickly. Uh, supporting military security through energy security, uh, so uh, supply chains for, uh, for NATO and our enhanced forward presence troops. Um, and then finally, countering Russian malign influence and disinformation, specifically targeting the European energy sector. And I think that's where I'd like to kind of make a few statements briefly about, uh, about Nord Stream 2. Briefly. And where, where we yep. have. Um, so I, I just want to quote my new boss, uh, Secretary Pompeo, who on May 23rd said the following on Nord Stream 2 to kind of set a baseline of, of where and why we are engaged on this issue. So he said, to the extent that the Europeans are dependent or reliant on Russian energy, it makes their freedom of movement and pushing back against Russia much more limited. We should continue to push against the Nord Stream 2 pipeline uh, and to have that ended. We should not increase the dependence of that, uh, that Europe has on Russian energy. And if we can achieve those things, we'll put Europe on a much more sound footing. So if there is a day in the future where there is a crisis, where there's a real challenge, and Russia decides to use that tool to advance its interests, that there are substitutes or capacities uh, sure. uh, that that power, that lever that Russia has, won't exist. So that breaks into four areas that I'll just briefly say of what our, our, our policy and concerns are, and then I'd like to maybe in the panel discussion respond to some of the, the market and, and legal aspects. So a lot of European countries, I think uh, uh, 11 to 13 European countries at any, any given moment are 75 to 100% dependent on Russian natural gas. And they see this as a strategic vulnerability, and we, we agree with them. Again, this is not the U.S. coming up with this. This is in our bilateral discussions, both when our European partners come to Washington or when we are in Europe. This is the main concern that they are raising with us. This is not us inventing a, uh, a position to, to push on the EU. So we see Nord Stream 2 would be basically diametrically opposed to all of these European energy security objectives. It would divide Europe and strengthen Russia's ability to use its energy resources for political coercion and malign influence. That's from, from anything from using energy uh, in terms of, uh, of, of its, its continued hybrid threat posture towards, uh, towards the EU and towards the West. That is, uh, that is to say, um, both in the disinformation space, both in the co-opting of, of former and senior uh, former and current uh, senior European and Western officials in, in the energy sector to push for the Kremlin's agenda, even outside of, of energy itself, allow Russia to use the pipeline's construction as an excuse to extend its already aggressive military posture in the Baltic Sea region, uh, undermining European energy diversification goals and stall critical market liberalization uh, work that the EU has uh, so tirelessly been working on for, for the past few decades, 
Uh, and then finally, and, and this is why, again, we're here today, to hurt Ukraine's economic and strategic stability by giving Russia the ability, along with a multi-line Turkish stream, I understand it's not just Nord Stream 2, to significantly reduce or end gas transit through Ukraine, which we believe not only is concerning because of the loss of transit revenues, I think that's, that's actually an ancillary concern, it's more because uh, Russia would have a freer hand to push for further uh, malign and, uh, and, and aggressive tactics towards Ukraine, both militarily in terms of its, uh, in terms of its hybrid threat posture, and, and that's why we oppose Nord Stream 2. Okay, we haven't heard the NAFTA gas uh, view really. Um, thank you on um, our, thank uh, you on Nord Stream. So, just <laughs> is the uh, the transit fees a, a, a minor issue or not? Uh, of course not, and not just for NAFTA gas, but for Ukraine as a whole. So, currently, uh, we get something like um, three billion dollars uh, for transit revenues. Uh, it's three percent of Ukrainian GDP. So for those uh, from you from more developed countries, we can easily multiply this number by like uh, 10 for some countries or for 100 for some countries, just to set the order of magnitude uh, of this number. Um, and, uh, but it's not like, uh, okay guys, and uh, we have to put things into perspective, uh, this year, despite the war, we had the moderate economic growth. Um, without transit, uh, this economic growth would turn into decline. Uh, so Germany is growing much faster than, for example, uh, Ukraine at the moment, and uh, uh, again, we would have a decline instead of even this kind of growth. Uh, at the same time, it's not that we want uh, some mercy. It's not like Ukraine says, look again, we really need this money, so please save us. Uh, what we're saying that, uh, again, the rules are rules, and uh, if uh, uh, we are saying, and in, for to some extent, what really admire, I mean, like, why, why we went to this revolution of dignity, basically, Ukrainians? Because uh, we looked at Europe uh, as, to some extent, a place uh, where people um, are really serious about values. And uh, not monetary values, but some other kind of values. For example, again, rule of law, again, fairness, uh, dignity, and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, I mean, that's the basis that we used, for example, in this arbitration. That's why we won, because we said, look, it's not, it was not about like mercy to Ukraine. For example, Russians are trying to portray uh, our victory in arbitration like tribunal uh, looked at poor Ukrainians and said, okay, let's give them something. It's not like about that. It's completely like not true. So only because we applied European laws, basically, uh, European rules, we were able to win uh, against Russians and to prove in the court that they basically had this near colonial policies. They were abusing the law. Because before, before we heard all these arguments from Germans, like, look, again, Russians, they just want basically to uh, sell gas to you at European terms. Yes, you basically depend on Russian the gas supplies, you want some subsidized prices, and they told us. Uh, and basically, that's why we support Germans. Again, the Germans were pressing Ukraine to sign the deal in 2009. Let's be honest about that. And they didn't want to go into details. They were okay with Russians saying that these contracts were about European rules. Right. It then turned out to be that there was nothing about European rules, at least there are the way Russians understood them. It was really like a near call policy. And Germans were okay with that. So, uh, just to conclude with this transit, where, I mean, yes, this amount is very important for us. But we're not begging, basically, f uh, to keep transit revenues for Ukraine. What we're saying, that, again, there should be rules, uh, this rule should be applied uh, to transit through Ukraine now, and Russians uh, refuse to apply these rules. Uh, unfortunately, again, uh, it seems like, at least what I heard, that it's very popular, this kind of old policy of uh, how it's called appeasement of an aggressor, because you need to balance kind of rules and, uh, appeasement. and peace. Appeasement. appeasement. Yes, appeasement. appeasement. So again, people are trying to appease the aggressor. That's why th Europe doesn't basically enforce their, their own rules vis-a-vis Gazprom, okay. not just in Ukraine, but in Europe. And should these rules be enforced, we won't have this issue without Nord Stream 2. All right. Um, if I, I'm going to come to you in a second, yes. but I'm going to go Alan first because he hasn't spoken for some time. Alan, what is the, why is this? Well, he has, but we have <laughs> not had quite the platform we wanted. What, 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 what is the basis of this division within Europe over Nord Stream? What is it really about, do you think? Well, it depends, it, depends, it depends who you're talking about. You're talking about the Russians, the Germans. Or mm. The point about what I would say is this, is that if you, what, the way to look at this is, I think, is to drill down into some of this, and I think you get this. You, you, you can work out where you're coming from. I mean, 
the trouble with Robert's arguments is that if you actually drill down into all of this, they kind of fall apart. You talk about Nord Stream 2 providing additional gas supply. It provides no new supply to Europe. It is merely a diversionary pipeline. So what actually you're doing is you're shifting gas from the Ukrainian system to Nord Stream 2, just as you did with Nord Stream 1. The entire plan is to... Why does it not supply extra? Because if you have extra capacity... Well, no, we, well, no that's the whole, the, well, the whole point. This is, we're, it's we're, a so diversion of gas rather it's than... It's a diversion of gas. The, uh, the object and clear express intent of Vladimir Putin directly, he said this, is, the, you know, is to take out the Ukrainian pipeline. Right, network. so that's the first thing. So it's no new gas supply. Second? We have some uh, extra capacity even now, so we can ship actually two times more gas than we're shipping now to Europe. Okay. The, the, second, the second problem is that, you know, you talk about, you know, I've never talked about all this extra demand. And if you look at the IA projections going back to the 1980s, right. they keep projecting all this extra L, uh, ga ga gas demand for Europe, and it falls. And then the, 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 the next problem is, is that this idea that all this gas is coming into Western Europe, Western Europe needs it. The gas isn't going to Western Europe. All the gas from, almost all the gas from, uh, from Nord Stream 2 is going to come into Graswald and then go back down in, 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 uh, through Jogal into Central and Eastern Europe. And that brings you to this other issue. I mean, one of the things that Nord Stream 2 lobbyists have been using is whole competitor talk, market, single market, competition, you can't tell where the molecules are coming from. It's actually unbelievably anti-competitive because what it's actually doing, because the gas is coming, you've got 55 billion cubic metres, most of the 55 billion cubic metres going into Central and Eastern Europe, plus another 36 billion uh, cubic metres via the Opel pipeline, which is the feeder for Nord Stream 1. So around 85 to 90 billion cubic metres of gas going into Central and Eastern Europe. They flood the west to east interconnectors. No other gas but Gazprom gas is going to enter the Central and Eastern Europe. So it reduces uh, the diversity of supply. Well, it, well it's, worse, it's worse than that. It, first of all, it divides Western Europe, Northwestern Europe, from Central Europe and Eastern Europe. Okay. It, it actually undermines the operation of the single market. It increases Gazprom's market dominance. It makes it more difficult because you have this flood of gas to get to get the investment necessary to build alternative infrastructure. Right. So you are seriously undermining the supply, uh, security, and increasing market dom dominance, and undermining the single market. This is my point earlier: is that when you are essentially undermining the single market, undermining European energy policy, and undermining European Union law, the willingness of the rest of the Union to see it, so to take. Um, both German and EU institutional uh, arguments about uh, the European Union and the integrity of the normative legal order, serious, is utterly undermined. And I just hey, want to, think one, like to can yeah. finish one thing on the law thing. You know, the, the difficulty with this is that I actually wasn't actually talking about the amendments of the gas directive, which I'll come to. I was simply talking about the simple application of union law, qua union law. We have got a situation where the Yamal pipeline, the South Stream pipeline, which are clearly, were clearly import pipelines to which EU law was applied. In relation to the South Stream pi pipeline, the Commission even brought infringement proceedings against Bulgaria for, 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 for uh, uh, engaging in it. So you, and in fact, one of the things that I have said to solve this problem is that the solution is, is for one of the Central Eastern European states, indeed for Ukraine, to sue the uh, the uh, on on the uh, sue the I think it would be the German regulator, and and bring the case right. to the European Court of Justice, and the the, the, the difficulty of this is that you think you can talk about uh, various uh, internal leaked council opinions, but the point about them they did what I would have done faced with having to draft something on this. When you've got a legal, uh, a, a factual situation or a legal situation which is against you and you're writing an opinion and you know who you're writing it for, what you do is you just simply ignore the point. So in all of the council documents, all in, uh, which uh, Fredwig refers to, they, they simply ignore the Yamal and South Stream um, uh, pipeline issue because it's an inconvenient truth. Which they have to avoid in order to able make to able to make my argument. Okay. And the, 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 the fundamental. I really have to come to. I know it's okay, but, but the fundamental yep. difficulty with all of this <laughs> is that what you end up with is a situation where it is, in all of the arguments that the that is used in Berlin, and a lot of the arguments used by the EU institutions to justify all of this, utterly lose the uh, policy elites of the Central and Eastern European states. You know, the sense that the systems are game to be played 
and it's not a system of law. And if it's not a system of law, well, that's why I'm trying lose. to get to what the underlying yeah. dynamics are. Yeah. I really must come to free with now. Yeah. So what, what Alan started saying there was that it doesn't diversify um, the route and it doesn't diversify the supply. And fundamental to what the European is, Union is trying to do is exactly that, create an open market. First of all, to one point to this uh, word appeasement that you used, and that's, that's really something. So what he's saying is you're appeasing uh, the Russians by doing that. So this is a diplomatic what? route that we shouldn't be going down. Uh, well, let, let me say one word to this appeasement uh, uh, thing that you just mentioned, and that, that really hurts. Um, I really want to say that. Uh, we, we had a German politician called Willy Brandt. Uh, he was not of my party, but... Uh, in the 70s, he was very courageous in looking for detente with the Soviet Union, uh, recognizing borders, which was very difficult for Germany, because he wanted peace and stability. And he said, peace is not everything, but without peace, everything is nothing. And I think that is very important. And there is a big difference between striving for peace, for detente policy, for uh, balancing interests on the one hand, and appeasement as we have known it from Mr. Chamberlain vis-a-vis -vis Hitler. And please don't use this as a, as a, and especially not against Germany, which has done, by the way, a lot for uh, projects of common interests, which pays a lot for Ukraine in all different parts. And please I don't really Putin. don't want you to say please we are, we are doing Putin appeasement when we word. do not. Right, but this is this simply is a diplomatic, really yeah, this is a, a, a diplomatic, a, a difference that's of the diplomatic tactics. The second point yeah. to to uh, th this notion of Alan uh, that uh, this is uh, too much gas coming from Russia. Well, if, if that gas is competitive with the price, that's fine. But if it's not competitive, if others come and have uh, better prices, uh, then others will, will get that. We have a single European gas market. And I say again, the more liquidity we have, the better for the, for the households and the better for the, for the industries. Uh, so, uh, in my point of view, we can uh, invite everyone, and I invite especially the United States, who has done in the past a lot for Europe, uh, without any doubt, and I've been a transatlanticist all my life, Benjamin, uh, as just you know. But uh, uh, I, I final point. this time, I think you really go too far, because you're not just benevolent. You're not the benevolent imperialist, as, as Spig Brzezinski has labeled it once. You want to come with sanctions. You, you claim that you know better than Europeans no. uh, uh, what should no. be done, how the European aims should be interpreted. And that is something that we do not like, and also those do not like, which are, have critical uh, questions towards Nord Stream. You okay. go too far with your pressure, and it is you who go around in Central and Eastern Europe and tell people, be tougher to the, to the Russians, don't make compromises. Yeah, so there is a disparity of... Uh, for, okay, uh, can we just come to Benjamin first and then uh, questions from the audience, please? Benjamin, just briefly answer them. The about this, this US diplomatic approach. He's not alone in thinking, um, that in, in feeling resentment against that. Uh, Freebert, I respectfully dis disagree with almost everything you just said with respect to the United States. <laughs> of course, the narrative uh, has again swung as the, the Russian narrative was in the 80s when we were opposed to, the, I believe it was the Druzba oil pipeline, was that right? That w the US at that point supposedly was just in this to sell its, uh, sell its coal to Europe. Now we hear, now it's just in this to sell its LNG to Europe. Of course, the US makes no apologies about wanting to sell its resources anywhere in the world. But, sure. but, but, this is a diversionary pipeline so let's say that it was our grand plan, which it is not, to stop Nord Stream 2 to sell US LNG. There is no new market that would open, so it would be a horrible plan. And I can tell you from sitting in thousands of hours of diplomatic conversations in Washington and in capitals all across Central and Eastern Europe and many capitals of Western Europe that the Europeans come to us all the time and want our help to support them in supporting European energy security efforts. So I take great offense that this is somehow the United States imposing its, quote, imperialistic will, you said? No. Absolutely not. This is in, in let, me, let me just I make one. I did not say sorry. that. You I said, uh, Brzezinski said it was a benevolent imperialist, and I uh, look for this benevolent today a little bit. Okay, uh, Benjamin, are yes. you done, or are we? I, I would actually like to make just one, one, one point quickly, wait, then. So what, is, what is it all about? What is Nord Stream actually all about? 
okay? So if it's not about new gas to Europe, which it's not, it's about the following things. We hear a lot of these, these narratives that this is gas for Germany that's needed for the energy vendor, for cheap gas for German industry, et cetera, et cetera. Let's look at the facts. The Eugal pipeline, which is the onshore portion of Nord Stream 2, which, by the way, the Bundesnetzagentur itself added three billion to its network development plan, so up to, from four billion to seven billion, which all of that money is going to be passed on to, uh, through tariffs or, or other means to, to consumers. Right. So this is not... It is. Okay. Um, Let's come back to that. Okay, we can come back to that. But German companies have stated a number of times that the Germany itself only plans to offtake 5 to 10 BCMA from the 55 uh, BCMA Nord Stream 2 pipeline. If this was for Germany, why build a 55 BCMA pipeline? Because the maximum capacity that the Eugal uh, uh, pipeline allows to go to Germany and points west, if this were somehow for a, a decline in, uh, in, in uh, production at Groningen, is 9.9 .9 BCMA. The rest is going to the exact endpoint where it currently goes through Ukraine to Baumgarten. So this is a complete red herring argument. What is this about for, for Russia? Well, Russia's had its stated geopolitical aim of ending transit through Ukraine. So that, that is one thing. The other thing is there is this spare bank report that came out last week which shows that a lot of the geopolitical motivation and economic motivation is to funnel money to contractors, uh, contractors run by Russian oligarchs, including Rotenberg and Timchenko. Mm -hmm. So that's that. And then the five companies, when, the, when Nord Stream 2's contract was signed, around the same time all signed upstream asset swap agreements with, uh, with Gazprom. So it really looks like it's, it's not a lot about European energy security and gas, but about exporting oligarchic practices into the heart of the EU. Right. With that thought, th there are some several interested speakers here. I is, uh, can I just first ask, is there anybody from the back who wants to ask any questions there? Um, yes, this gentleman here, because you haven't asked a question yet. Could you say your name and where you're from, please? Petra Nora. I'm a professor at the North University in Norway. Oh, hi. Two questions to Naftogas. Number one is, when will the unbundling of Naftogas take place? Uh-huh. Two... Everybody is talking about a 30 BCM kind of norm for normal transit through Ukraine. The, the figure has, I don't think Merkel actually has said it, but I mean it has actually been in, in the public domain. What does Naftogas and the Ukrainian things about that? Okay. Thank about you. that volume, yeah. yeah. Thank you for the question. So starting with unbundling. As soon as uh, this new management uh, came, like basically us, to Nafta Gas in 2014, uh, we very openly and very firmly basically uh, told everybody outside and inside uh, Nafta Gas that we are going to implement all European rules, including unbundling. So that's why, correct me if I'm wrong, it was in April 2014, in one month after we came basically as new management, we wrote a letter to, him, to Gazprom and said, look, we are implementing European rules uh, and our transit contract is not compliant with European rules. So for, for us, for example, to do this unbundling, we need to shift the, or to transfer basically, to assign the transit contract from Naftagas, the parent company, a vertically integrated company, to our transmission subsidiary. Our contract, transit contract, explicitly uh, prohibits any assignment of the rights. So we said, please let us allow, base, or please let's amend the contract to make it comply with European rules. You were telling the whole world that it's a European contract. Again, Germans supported you. So let's finally make it European. They said, forget about it. We went to the arbitration. Four years we spent in arbitration. Ah, by the way, before going to arbitration, went to the European Commission. And we said, look, we have a problem here. You are saying that you are supporting, again, the application of European rules, and our contract is not compliant. And, by the way, contract between Gazprom and Slovakia. By the way, somebody mentioned, you mentioned, that uh, the uh, EU commissioner, the Slovak um, representative, <laughs> is very, uh, not very, uh, he's not anti-Russian, that's what you said, but he's not pro-Russian, yes? So he was said, okay, so in Slovakia, there is a contract, Slovakia, EU country, yes? There is a contract uh, between Gazprom uh, and Slovak TSO, Ustream, uh, it's a so-called legacy contract, but it, it has no, it doesn't enjoy an, enjoy, uh, an um, ex, um, exemption from the third energy package. So this contract is not compliant with the third energy package. So let's enforce European rules against Gazprom. The European Commission said, no, look, we're a hostage. 
to Gazprom because Europeans depend on Russian gas. If we start enforcing basically our own rules against Gazprom, our people will die because there will be no gas like cold houses. Okay, so they advised us to go to the, uh, to the tribunal. We went to the tribunal, we spent four years. The tribunal said, also we won all, all these billions of dollars, the tribunal said, look, it's really not our job. With all, again, that's not, that's not what they said, with all due respect, but again, <laughs> we can kind of figure it out. Uh, they said, okay, there is a competent authority, Ukrainian regulator, so they should enforce the implication of the European and Ukrainian law to this contract. Hmm. Ukrainian regulator understands that the only way to enforce, basically, uh, this application is just to stop transit to Europe. Of course, Ukraine will never do it, because the next day, first of all, again, it will be a humanitarian catastrophe to some extent to some Europeans. Mm. Second, the next day, Russians will say that Ukraine is not a reliable transit country, and Germany will forget about 50 years of occupation of their country by Russians, and they will say, look, we have so wonderful relations with Russians, basically, they're so reliable partner, and Ukraine is not reliable, so let's build Nord Stream 2. Okay, That's why we will never stop the transit, but just to, fi to finish this point. Uh, now, basically, we're in a situation when we want to do unbundling, we want to transfer this contract to a TSO so that we can unbundle it. Again, Gazprom refuses. Europeans say there is nothing we can do. Maybe these trilaterals will help. Let's see, although I doubt that Russians will even discuss it. And uh, we're again in this catch-22 situation, when basically they say you have to unbundle. We have we the only way for us to unbundle basically is Gazprom. Yet the second question about 30 BCM, again, it's another just uh, red herring, as you, as you say. So first of all, again, we are apl applying European rules. European rules about cost-reflective tariffs. It's not about negotiations, like about volume. So what we say that we have a certain cost, basically, associated with transit. This cost should be uh, covered. Otherwise, we have already initiated a new dispute, basically. And if we don't uh, resolve this dispute, we will go into another arbitration uh, against Gazprom. Okay, I must allow Freebit to answer that, please. But I, I have a question. I, imagine the Russians would, just, just for yeah. a minute, imagine the Russians would accept the arbitration, uh, pay these uh, two point some billion. 2.56. Secondly, we have an agreement, let's say we, we call it, uh, one American in, in, in the Atlantic uh, Council has called it a grand bargain. Uh, Morningstar has said, why not tr find a grand bargain? We have a grand bargain with 30 BCM, something like it, let it be 35 or something, uh, which go through uh, Ukraine. Uh, we have a, a common um, uh, joint uh, companies, uh, a consortium, uh, which modernizes uh, the uh, pipeline through Ukraine uh, together. A, a big endeavor to modernize it. Uh, and then we built Nord Stream. Would, would you go along with it, or do you say North against Nord Stream at any price? Okay, look, we are not... Can, no, 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 wait, can I just uh, allow you to come in? Just uh, yeah, Nord Stream I, at any price? I, I just want to say, yeah, Nord Stream at any price, I, I think the, the answer is, is no, obviously, um, because well, whereas we very much welcome Chancellor Merkel's statement from, I think it was, what, in April, like several weeks ago, that she views this as not just a commercial deal, as was previously the case, but having political implications. We absolutely agree with that. Yeah. This is abs we absolutely agree with that. Here's the problem, though. Having that as some sort of quid pro quo to say, okay, uh, Russian Federation, Gazprom, please sign for X amount of BCM. That gets this, the, the gas going through Ukraine. Then we're green lighting Nord Stream 2. The objective, as I said earlier, and has been stated by very, very clearly by the Russian Federation, is to circumvent Ukraine through these infrastructures. So you would be building in the technical capability to undermine that agreement. And let's put it this way, I do agree, as Freebert said, that in the gas sector, there has been 50 years of reliable supplies to Western Europe. Yeah. That's not the case in Eastern Europe. And let's put it this way, even this, uh, in the past year, in the energy space, Western Europe has been, um, I, I'd say, fooled by the Kremlin in the sense that the four gas turbines that were, that were meant to go to the Russian Federation from Siemens instead were even, even given assurances by Vladimir Putin that, no, they were actually is go it, move to Crimea in, in, in violation isn't of Isn't the heart of this, though, not a difference in opinion as to how to approach Putin and how to deal with this particular problem? Is that not really the center of this? I mean, even the U.S. administration, if you 
pardon me, being disrespectful, has changed its mind a little bit on this. I mean, it's, it's not an easy one to handle. Alan, is that not the centre of it? That well, the di diplomatic approach really is different here. Well, the difficulty with all of this, and the trouble I, I have with Freebirds' approach, is that we have actually done this before. I mean, this is like we've had reset after reset. Germany has been talking about dialogue for uh, a couple of decades, and we've had dialogue and dialogue, and then we have invasion, invasion, and then we have dialogue and dialogue, and invasion, invasion. Right, so and this it comes down to politics. And the po peace, and, and we had reunification, and... Uh, uh, not so since... So well, it depends what, where you would have put the clock Well, well the thing is, is, well, you know, <laughs> well, let, let's take from Vladimir, right. Vladimir Putin's accession to office in 2000. We've had, we've had all this, we've, I mean, endless things in Berlin where the German officials say X, Y, and Z, and we're going to have this lovely dialogue in, in lots of different ways, in lots of different right. formats. I have a question. And then the, the, the Russians do something else, shock. Yeah, or okay, so there's a difference in, in political. I'm just going to, gentlemen, keep your answer short, please. A question here from the front. Has anybody else got a question from the back? Yes, and of course, yes. Just quickly, please. Uh, it won't be quite as quick, but I try to be quick. The name of my company is not for nothing gas value chain. I really support the product and I would like to see it thrive also in the interest of battling climate change. And therefore, I will try to make four purely commercial points, no politicizing, no legalizing, and so on. Okay. Point number one, the IGU Wholesale Gas Survey Report, very renowned, ninth edition this year, says that gas on gas pricing in the Northwest European market is 92%. That is 8% oil index price. If I'm not mistaken, the Russian share in gas supplies to Northwest Europe is more than 8%. So the market, with some of us arbitrating, has beaten the Russian gas pricing into submission. So I would disagree with you, sir, to say Russian gas is anti-competitive gas. The second point, also a commercial one, is a, an erroneous perception, an out-of-date perception of security of supply. The IEA has, since 2016, parallel to the World Energy Outlook, also issued a global gas security review. It has already said in its first edition that with the second gas revolution, namely the LNG revolution, you know, the definition of security of supply on a regional basis is no longer appropriate. Why? because we have now a rising availability of LNG, two-thirds of which is destination flexible and price responsive. Mm. And when you say you have with Nord Stream 1, 2, a terrorist concentration risk, and you also implicitly said, you know, an exposure to political blackmail, then I say, well, may it happen, yep. you know, but then the prices in the traded markets will rise and it will attract price responsive LNG. So LNG is the marginal source of supply, not the permanent one, but it puts a price cap on the market. Okay. Yeah, and the last point is maybe, you know, on additional, on additional Greece, Ukrainian Greece, transit or Ukrainian Greece, transit. Greece. The NPD in Norway, uh, uh, together with gas, is scratching the head, you know, should we not expand the transportation system? Because both Norway and Russia have had record sales to Europe in the last two years. And the same is then, you know, presenting an opportunity to Naftogaz to sit down at the table and negotiate because the Russians are now in a position to say, our capacity is fully utilised. Can we not strike a deal? Okay. Thank you. Can I thank you very much? I, I just would like to take, I think we've established that there is a political contention over this, but I'd like to hear from Naftogaz and the chairman once again, uh, just finally, please. We have 45 um. seconds. <laughs> that's, that's, I am afraid to show it because you want a bit more. But uh, I'd like to drive the uh, temperature discussion a bit down and uh, just uh, give you my perspective uh, from point of view of natural gas. But looking at, uh, let's say, position of Western Germany and, oh, sorry, Western Europe and Germany in particular. Uh, it's obvious that uh, everybody's trying to protect their own interests. That's yeah. natural. No doubt about that. And uh, you mentioned this discussion about legality of extension of third energy package uh, around Nord Stream 2, that it's illegal, and uh, let's leave legality aside, but let's look at it from purely commercial, like, substance perspective. If I was on your side, uh, on your plates, looking at position of Mr. Putin and Russia... I'm, I'm, not, I'm not Gazprom. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm looking from position of uh, Western yeah. Europe. Of Germany, uh, I would of say. Germ oh, okay. uh, yeah. Western Europe, but Germany in particular. Uh, I believe that recent events have proved something what just the previous speaker described. Uh, Russians have lost 
uh, their ability to blackmail Germany or Western Europe with gas. Yes. They can't blackmail with volume. That's gone. Yes. Mm. But Europe is the only and most lucrative customer Gazprom has. Yes. All their this, uh, promises about we go to China have turned up totally negative for them. Mm -hmm. And totally also, well, that, that's, a, that's a fact. So they basically have no choice, which I believe is a sign that Russia is more dependent in terms of gas supply on Europe than Europe is dependent on Russia. Yes, and I agree. Good. Okay, but now, looking at the situation, uh, I don't understand one thing. European companies have a lot of equity production in Russia, which is blocked there by this presidential decree of Mr. Putin that Gazprom is the only monopoly exporter except for some energy projects, which are very rare, and that's kind of total different thing. So European companies are struggling to get their gas out of Russia. Uh, and they are not able to do so because the position of Russian government and Mr. Putin per se. Why don't they put a very, I mean, European Commission, make a simple trade-off? We extend certain energy package on this pipeline, which means you can build and you can use the pipeline, provided you unlock your restriction for our companies to export gas to Europe. In their position, if I was in their place, that would seem a very pragmatic choice. That would remove all the criticism from many people around uh, and problem also from US. The political uh, question uh, stays there. But then that would also allow us as Ukrainians to compete with other uh, routes by asking private producers in Russia to use our route to transit gas through Ukraine. That could be a win-win situation. And that situation, I would say, is very lucrative exactly for European companies and mostly for them. And the fact that the European Commission is not proposing this position, having Mr. Schroeder in Russia understanding all these mechanics, that's kind of surprised me. Okay, but there, unfortunately, we really must leave it. Can I just say, we would continue this discussion over lunch. There are two exits onto the terrace. I would like to thank Professor Alan Riley, uh, Mr. Yuri Vitrenko, uh, Benjamin here, and uh, Dr. Fiebert Fluger. And I apologize to all of you for uh, the shortage of time. Thank you so much for your commitment and passion. This has been one of the most informative mornings I think I've ever had in my life. Thank you so much to all of you.